Grace and peace are yours, from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today is a portion of the Old Testament lesson from Lamentations chapter 3. Uh, we, we read again, uh, beginning at verse 27. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is still young. Let him sit alone and be silent, for God has disciplined him. Let him put his mouth in the dust, perhaps there is still hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him. Let him be filled with disgrace. For the Lord will not reject us forever. Even if he causes suffering, he will show compassion according to the abundance of his faithful love. For he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering on mankind. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, no one I know desires a harder life. No one wakes up one morning and says to himself, you know, it's just all going too well. My life is running too smoothly. I'm going to go out and do something stupid to bring some chaos into my life. I am going to make some enemies who can bring me some grief. I am going to put myself in harm's way. Uh, somewhere. If nothing else, I'll pray to God not not to make my life so easy, to, to, to bring me some troubles so that it doesn't go so well. No one I know thinks that way. But that doesn't mean we don't know people, as I'm sure you do, who who carry that out in practice, right? There are those who seem to be professionals at self-destruction. Maybe you yourself have followed that path at times. But that's not the goal for anyone I know. There's no real advantage in trying to destroy your own life. That does not mean that the troubles we face in life may not actually serve for our good. Actually, many of them have a a, a leavening, a a good effect on both heart and on life. But, you know, the scriptures themselves say that suffering produces character. We, We understand that it, it, it is in those hard times that we are tested and often grow and mature. Uh, Mark Twain even went so far once as to say that there is nothing weaker than an untested virtue. And, and the phrase that we all hear from the people who hang out at the gym a lot, that, that, that has become kind of a, a common metaphor for how things work there, also has application in life in general. Many times, no pain, no gain. From the words I just read to you from the book of Lamentations, it would appear that the author here, probably the prophet Jeremiah, that's whom it's uh, usually accredited to, thought the same way. There is a lesson to be gained from the tough things that we experience in life, and uh, in his eyes, the sooner the earlier, the better. And so today, his, his writing lays out for us some of the advantages, the advantages of bearing your burdens early. And, and, and the advantages of bearing your burdens early, he lists out for us here in, in at least two blessings. They come as a matter of God's discipline. And they come with a promise, with God's promise of relief. 
Whether they were young or old, Jeremiah's contemporaries were certainly suffering under a burden, uh, a, a tragedy that had taken place in their life and in their time that was going to have huge impact upon the rest of their lives. The Babylonians had come. It invaded Judah, had besieged and destroyed Jerusalem, had carried the leading citizens off into exile. That's what the lament in Lamentations is all about this great tragedy that, that, that faced the nation. The, these people, it seemed, had lost everything. They had lost their homes. They had lost their wealth. They had lost their freedom. They had lost their national identity. All of it seemed to be gone. But the prophet says, perhaps not all is lost because he understood that these things come from God's own hand as his own matter of discipline. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is still young. Let him sit alone and be silent for God has disciplined him. A friend of mine growing up was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes when he was just two years old. He was uh, an only son. His parents loved him deeply. They gave him practically anything he wanted. The one thing they didn't give him much was discipline. They, they rarely corrected his behavior, at least not in a way that had any teeth. And this did not serve him well. When he was a little boy, in spite of his diabetes, he ate far too many sweets. When he got to be in his teens and 20s, he drank far too much beer. And by the time he was in his 20s already, as a result of his diabetes, he was beginning to lose his eyesight. He suffered neuropathy from the, the nerve damage that can happen as a result, all of this while he was still a relatively young person. No child goes to their parent and says, would you discipline me more? Would you spank me when I'm getting out of line or make whatever privileges you are taking away from me hurt so much that I, I learn my lesson well and soon a child isn't going to go to their parents and say that kind of thing. But I think we understand that the earlier in life the discipline begins, the better it is for the future. The Jews who were experiencing this this national tragedy I just described to you at the time of Jeremiah were th themselves undergoing a, a discipline that came from God's own hands. You know, for century, the, centuries, the Lord had been ramping up the consequences for the bad behavior that they had continued to show. And so, the Lord came and he would let them be subject to famine. And, and then he would let them be subject to wars, which they would lose. And then they were subject to losing their own territory. And when all of that wasn't enough, here finally it got to the point where he sent them into exile. Perhaps that, the Lord thought, perhaps that is going to lead them to finally see the, the light, to, to, to change their ways so that they will do what they're supposed to do. Then perhaps they would stop being so materialistic and greedy in the way that they treated their neighbors. Then they would stop perverting marriage and sexuality. Uh, then they would stop running off into all kinds of idolatries with the pagan gods of the nations that surrounded them. The bad behavior was not only destroying their society, their their national life together, but far worse, it was destroying their faith. Now, now, the Lord had never been the indulgent parent who simply let his wayward children get away with whatever they wanted. It was not as though there hadn't been consequences in the past. But now it seemed that this new level of discomfort with going into exile finally got his people's attention. 
finally there was a response in the direction he was looking, this exile in a foreign land. Uh, the, and the younger to be humbled in that way. The sooner that they would bear this yoke, that they would carry this burden, that they would be turned away from their faith-destroying sins. Well, the better, right? It was good, as the writer says here, it was good for a young man to bear the burden, to, 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 to carry this yoke while he is still young. Let, let, let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is still hope. This day may have meant humiliation and defeat for them, where they had to, to, to bow down before their enemies with their faces in the dirt. But what may have meant humiliation today and hope for their future. Well, then they could approach their lives and live under God with a sense of piety and realism, more dependent on God, less full of themselves. Well, then, then there was hope for them to, to live out their lives with better priorities and have better marriages and, and, and foster better families and most of all have a better faith. My grandfather did not enjoy starting his adult life just as the Great Depression was taking hold in our country. Another kind of discipline, a chastisement that God brought upon this country after a decade of wild living. He turned 20 about the same time as the stock market crash of 1929. And that was not fun, and he would not tell you that he enjoyed it. But at the same time, he would credit that, that, that disciplining hand of God, the national life of the people that also affected him, he would credit that with helping him to come to understand at an early age what was really important. It, it, it enabled him to have a better sense of values, to get his priorities in line. And that discipline turned out to be a blessing for him later in life. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him. Let him be filled with disgrace. The writer continues, well, these sounds will sound a lot like the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. When, so when someone hurts us, what's the first thought we have? Don't we often feel like, I want justice. This person who hurt me needs to pay. But do we consider that what may be really going on is that God is offering us discipline from our lives, from his own loving hand, that in the process of suffering such things, what really needs to happen is that we learn patience and sacrifice and love. That in the midst of such things, God is making us stronger. He's building our endurance. Most of all, he's making us more like the one we follow, more like our Savior Jesus, who did what? Who was willing to let go of everything in this world and love his enemies and even die for them and to save the entire world by his death so that we, so that we might be able to look forward to a life that would be free from the kinds of disciplines from God's hand in which those kinds of disciplines from God's hand would be nothing more than a, a distant memory. So yes, the author is right when he asserts that there's an advantage, an advantage to bearing the yoke, to bearing the burden. Early in life. Because when it comes to God's people, it comes as a discipline, as a matter of discipline from God's own hands. And that will not only serve us in our life now, but can also bless us in our souls forever. Well, then there is the second blessing that the Lord has in mind, a, a second promise that comes uh, uh, along in his advantage of bearing our burdens uh, early, and that is that the promise of relief itself has been attached. 
For the Lord will not reject us forever, even if he causes suffering. He will show compassion according to the abundance of his faithful love, for he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering on mankind. Well, let's not miss that the burdens we bear, the discipline that may come from God's hands, uh, does have this feature of expressing to us something of God's anger at sin. It's, it's at some place in its root why it happens. He didn't send Israel into exile because he was particularly pleased with them. In my growing up, my, my parents didn't chastise or discipline me with a broad smile on their face because somehow uh, I had pleased them by my snotty, bratty behavior. And, and so with the Lord, uh, similar. A holy God cannot endure sin. He will separate himself from both sin and sinner where there is no change. All of life's troubles, big or small, have some place embedded in them, the call for God's people to repent. It's been that way since the Garden of Eden. But he does not reject us forever. I mean, we may come to realize that that, 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 that the reason that we go through these problems is because we are sinners and we live in a sinful world and that the discipline of God is something that's, that's baked into the cake. It's, it's, a, it's a part of why that all happens. You know, I, I, I am a sinner. We all are sinners. And that means we suffer here. But that is only one of the things that God, only one of the things that God is associating with his hand of discipline. And it's not even the greater part. We have this promise, also the promise that he will bring relief. The Lord actually is seeking us. You know, if my parents sent me off to my room sometime because I'd been bad, they weren't banishing me to my room forever, you know, like I'm Cinderella in the tower or something. But he, he is doing, they, they were doing so because uh, they eventually were going to come and get me, right? They were going to come and they were going to find me and they were going to restore me once again as their loving and obedient son. And when God did the same thing here with Israel, it's the same, same story. He was not sending them off into Babylon in exile because he was banishing them from his presence forever. The Lord was seeking them. Truly what he intended was to have them back. Making them more like the people he wanted them to be. In 70 years, he came to them and he let them out and he restored them. His loving and obedient sons and daughters. The yoke, this, this burden, which was the exile, that was only for a time. That was God's promise. That was a relief. Even if he causes suffering, he will show compassion according to the abundance of his faithful love. Now, the word for uh, compassion in the Hebrew here, rachum, is an interesting way of describing God's good feelings towards his people. You know, usually when we think of God's love, the first word that comes to mind is his grace. And, and, and grace is a word which always has connected to it this idea that God is loving us though we don't deserve to be so loved. Uh, it, it, it always has our sin in the background. And it's a wonderful concept. It, it's something for which we should be entirely grateful. We'd be completely lost without it. And yet, when we have the word grace, there is always this idea of our sin and disobedience that's somehow attached there. But, but Rahum, God's compassion, often in other translations, simply stated as his mercy, well, this is every bit a heart word. It is a word that is a dear and filled with God's emotion towards his people. He feels towards us. He does not like to see us suffer. It moves him. It hurts God to see us suffer. He feels it even if he is the one who imposed that suffering on us in the first place. He wants to relieve it, for he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering on mankind. Well, if that's the case, well, then why did he let it happen in the first place? In the first week of August, 
this year, about a month and a week from now, I am going to have the fourth surgery of my life. And from my previous surgeries, I know that the pain can range anywhere from being mild discomfort to general soreness to I don't want to move kind of agony. Of course, for the procedure itself, they knock you out, thankfully. But in the recovery, in the recovery, that, that can hurt. Hurt for a while. Many of you have experienced this personally. The doctor knows. He knows I'm going to hurt. But that's not why he wants to operate. At least I don't think that's why he wants to operate. He's looking to restore me. He wants to bring me better health. His intent is that I could be better. Uh, he's aware that I, I will have such pain. Maybe he thinks about that pain. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Um, but he is focused on fixing the problem. The Lord allows us to carry our yoke. He, he lets us bear our burdens, e e even when they are quite painful. He knows about the pain we suffer. He sometimes is bringing it into our lives. But his intent is to preserve our lives to look out for our spiritual health, to make us better, to keep our faith. And unlike like my doctor, I know that God does know about the pain. He does think about it. And he does not like it because he has compassion. It's as a result of that compassion that while he might let the pain happen. He might let us bear the burden for a while. He is only going to let that happen so far, so long as is necessary. And when it has blessed us, when it has brought us the intent for which he allowed it into our lives in the first place, then he will bring it to an end. With him there is relief. That's his promise. With the burdens we bear, whether early or late. The Lord never told us that we should enjoy our problems or our pain. He doesn't. He, he actually made us to dislike them. He, he knew that they were meant to tell us that something is wrong. But even in the burdens that we carry in life, God has a tool for working our good. When they inevitably come, it is to our advantage to bear them. The sooner we do, the sooner we find his blessings. Amen. Please stand.